Computers on the Moon by Mark Schulman. We are about to learn a lot about that tonight and how dedicated engineers and software developers made it happen, even at least half a century ago. Mark's career has been in computers. He's been a computer instructor, a software designer, and a small business owner. Concur currently, he works as the IT manager for a group of family practice physicians and a company that runs clinical drug trials. I can't wait to hear uh, how computers got a man to the moon because I remember watching it happen. So let's give a big stug welcome to Mark Schulman. Thanks very much. This is my favorite presentation of all the presentations I do. I hope you'll enjoy it. This is not going to be full of uh, useful tips and tricks. This is strictly just history. But to me, there's a lot of good stories in the history of computers. But to me, this is the most interesting one about how people entrusted their lives to get them to a planet a quarter of a million miles away and back. And I hope to show you a little bit about why that was such a, an interesting trick and how it helped the development of uh, computer technology. So during this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the little known role of the computer that got us to the moon, and you'll actually get to see how it worked. So we'll start off with the dawn of the space age. And this is something that's particularly interesting, I think, to those of us that live in Florida, because a lot of people that perhaps some people on this call, certainly people that you probably know, worked on some aspect of the, the space program. And we're mostly con concerned with the 1960s. The first American in space occurred in 1961, and we landed on the moon in 1969. So a period of about nine years. So the first Americans in space traveled on a project called Mercury. And there were six flights, and uh, each one put a single person in orbit. And the interesting thing about Mercury is that really all it could do is just put the spacecraft into orbit and bring it back. They couldn't maneuver at all. They couldn't change their orbit. They were just essentially launched into orbit. They took photos, they observed what they saw, and then they came back. And that was really all it could do. Here's a picture of the control panel in a Mercury spacecraft, and you can see it looks very analog. There's a lot of dials and switches and lights, and there is not a computer in sight. Uh, Mercury did not have a computer. Now, an interesting thing happened right after the first Mercury flight. And the thing that was interesting about this was the first flight was only 15 minutes. It was Alan Shepard. We shot him up into space. He didn't even go into orbit. He came right back. And right after that happened, our president, John Kennedy, did a really amazing thing. He committed the United States to landing on the moon before the end of the decade. And he said, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. This was an incredibly uh, bold action. It would be as if we uh, committed to circumnavigate the globe in an airplane right after the Wright brothers had made their first flight. So really, really gutsy. And that's, you can see on this timeline, it was right at the beginning of the Mercury program that he made that commitment. And ultimately, there would be about 400,000 Americans working on trying to achieve this goal. So Mercury was followed by the Gemini program. And it was a much larger spacecraft that could carry two people, and it ran from 1965 to 1966. Um, the interesting thing about Mercury was, by this time, we were committed to going to the moon, so we specifically wanted to work on things that we were going to need to get us to the moon. Now, nobody ever intended that Gemini would go to the moon, but it was intended as a program in which we could practice the things we were going to need to be able to go to the moon. So the goals of the project were 
we had to learn to work outside the spacecraft. Uh, an American had never left a spacecraft before Project Gemini started. And obviously, if we were going to explore another world, we needed to be able to get outside the spacecraft. We had to practice rendezvous and docking. And what that means is two spacecraft finding each other in space, being able to navigate to each other in space and be able to connect the two spacecrafts together. And finally, we had to be able to maneuver in space. Obviously, if we're going to get from the Earth to the moon, we have to be able to maneuver from the Earth to the moon. And we have to be able to change orbits, increase altitude, decrease altitude, get into different orbits. And so those were the three goals of, of Gemini. And it's the last one I really want to focus on. Uh, maneuvering in space, highly mathematical. I've seen the equations that were used to get us to the moon, the, the mathematical formulas, and they will make your eyes bleed. They're uh, incredible formulas. Maneuvering in space is completely non-intuitive, and I'll give you an example of that in just a second. And there's a reason why they call this rocket science. It's very, very complicated, and it's just about impossible to do without a computer. And let me give you an example, just the maneuver to get you from the earth to the moon requires that you fire a rocket engine while you're on the side of the earth that's away from the moon. You have to add exactly the right amount of speed, which is 7,500 miles per hour, when you have no sensation of speed. And by that, think of yourself in an airliner. Now, it's, it's much worse in space, but when you're in an airliner, you're traveling at 500 miles an hour, you don't feel like it. You have no real sensation of speed. And if the airliner sped up by about 10 miles an hour, you'd never know it. You can't, act, you can't accurately control your speed just by intuition and feel when you're this high up. So it's even worse in space. So from the side of the Earth away from the moon, you have to add exactly 7,500 miles per hour to your speed when you have no sensation of speed. And you have to do that so that three days later, you will arrive at a point in space exactly 70 miles ahead of where the moon will be at that point three days later. And there's no way a human can do this themselves. You have to have a computer. If we look at the control panel on the Gemini spacecraft, which looks like this, we do actually see some stuff that looks like it might be part of a computer. And in fact, the Gemini was the first spacecraft that actually had a digital computer on board. Now, it couldn't do much, but it could do some calculations. And here's what the main data entry panel looked like. And you can see by what we're used to today with computers, it was very primitive, but it was a genuine programmable digital computer. And then Gemini was followed by the Apollo program. And the goal of the Apollo program was to land people on the moon. You can see it involves much larger spacecraft and it actually involves two spacecraft. So we have the Apollo command and service module, the one second from the end uh, with a cone on the top and the cylinder in the middle. And we'll talk about that and the big engine. And the purpose of that spacecraft was to take the two spacecraft to the moon, and then two of the three astronauts would get in the lunar module, the one you see on the far right, and actually land on the moon. And here's the timeline for that. The Apollo program started about 1960, or it started making test flights of around 1967, sorry, 67, and ran through the end of 1972. And this will show you about when Apollo 11 occurred, which was the first landing on the moon in which people walked on the moon. And we got it right the first time. So we said we had to have a computer. What did that look like? So let's talk about designing and building a computer that could be used to get us to the moon. So early in the program, it became apparent that these were the things we needed a computer to do. We needed it to be able to execute trajectories to get us from the Earth to the moon. That is, it had to figure out how much additional speed do I need, where do I need to aim, and so on. 
it had to be able to continuously update its position and attitude in space. And when we talk about attitude, that's the, the word that the astronauts used, that the controllers used. They just mean which direction is the spacecraft pointing. And we have no problem on Earth telling which way we're pointing. We know up, down, left, right. It's easy for us to do. But when you're out in the middle of empty space, knowing which way you're pointing is really difficult had to be able to control the spacecraft's engines and thrusters, had to be able to display flight data for the crew, and it had to be able to receive remote updates from the ground. We'll talk more about that in just a second. So with that background, what did computers look like in the 1960s when all of this was taking place? Well, a typical computer in the 1960s looked like this. And this is actually one of NASA's computing facilities called the Real-Time Computing Center. And this photo was shot in 1966. Computers typically took up whole rooms and required special air conditioning to keep all that uh, computing equipment cool. How are we gonna put anything like that on board a, uh, board a spacecraft? And lest you forget, the state of personal computers back in the 1960s looked like this. There was no such thing as a real personal computer. So how are we going to solve this problem of getting a workable computer on board a spacecraft? The hero of our story is a guy named Charles Stark Doc Draper, and he was the, ed, the head of the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory in Massachusetts. And he believed when he heard about the Apollo program that his team could build a digital computer for a moon mission that he could fit in a spacecraft. And the most serious problem that everybody was dealing with was weight. In a, a space flight, especially back then, weight was everything. The big thing they had to worry about was what did the spacecraft weigh? What did all what did the people weigh? What did the cargo weigh? Because the rocket could only lift so much weight. And they just couldn't afford to dedicate a ton or or a thousand pounds to the computer. So the big goal was how do we get a computer that doesn't weigh a ton? So he and his team made some crucial decisions. The first thing was that the computer would be a digital computer. Now, today we think of just about all computers as being digital computers. We don't even say the word digital anymore because when someone says computers, we just understand that they're digital computers. And many of you may not even know but I, what I mean by that term. But in the 1960s, uh, most computers were actually analog computers, and that was a whole different breed of computers. You don't see them much today anymore, although they're still used for some purposes. But it was a bold move of his to decide that we were going to use digital computers. He was going to save weight and power by using integrated circuits, which had only recently been developed. This idea that these newfangled integrated circuits could make up the computer that he was going to design was also a bold move. Now, back then, you know, we think of when we build a computer, the entire CPU, the computing part of the computer is all on a single chip. Such a thing didn't exist back then. The, the only thing that an integrated circuit could contain was a single logic circuit or maybe a couple of logic circuits. So, he was actually going to need thousands and thousands of these integrated circuits to build his computer, but that was still way better than the alternative of using individual, what we call discrete components, transistors, capacitors, resistors, and so on. So this still saved a lot of weight and a lot of power. And there were lots of different logic integrated circuits that he could have used, and probably anybody else would have used a mix. So there would have been all kinds of different integrated circuits in the computer. But he made an important decision early on, and that was that they were going to manage to design this computer using all identical integrated circuits. So every there were about 4,000 of these integrated circuits in each computer, and they all 
consisted, all 4,000 of them were exactly identical. And what this enabled them to do was to find somebody who could build just this one part and build it really well and really reliably and then just crank out thousands and thousands of them. So that's what they did. And work began on the computer in 1961. Now think about that. That was when we were putting the very first people in, in orbit. And we already realized by that time, Kennedy had committed us to go to the moon. And we already realized that we were going to need a computer if we were going to make that happen. So work on the computer actually began that far back. So here's a timeline, an updated timeline. And you can see where Kennedy committed us to go to the moon and computer development on this computer started almost immediately. And then you can see where the first uh, moon landing actually was. So what did they come up with? They came up with a computer called the Apollo Guidance Computer or AGC. So it was developed by the MIT Instrumentation Lab. And when the design was done, it was actually manufactured by a company called Raytheon, very big in the defense industry. And the cost of the program was $26.6 million. Doesn't sound like a lot of money today for a government program, but that was a ton of money back then. And this is what the computer itself looked like. It was a 15-bit computer. It had 36K words of read-only memory, or what we today would call ROM, and 2K words of read-write memory, what they called erasable memory, what we would call today RAM. Now, a word was roughly two bytes. They didn't actually use bytes. So if you double those numbers, you're talking about a computer that had about 72K of ROM by our measurements today and about 4K of RAM. That's not very much. And they managed to get us to the moon and back in just that amount of memory. And it weighed about 70 pounds. Now, that's just the computer with the unit you see there. So each mission to the moon consisted of two spacecraft. We talked earlier about the command and service module, which is where the crew rode to and from the moon, got into orbit around the moon, and then two of the three people got into the lunar module and actually landed on the moon. And there was an Apollo guidance computer in each spacecraft. So every launch, there was a spacecraft, uh, I'm sorry, a computer in the command and service module and a computer in the lunar module. The hardware in both spacecraft was identical, but different software in each spacecraft, which reflected what each spacecraft had to do. So command and service module had to get everything to and from orbit around the moon, and the lunar module had to actually be able to land. So different software. Now, you may have noticed that the computer looked like it was two pieces connected together. If we go back and look at it, you can kind of see it's in two pieces there. And in fact, if you open it up, this is what it looked like inside. And you can see it's a whole bunch of modules. And each one of these modules was responsible for a particular task. So one module might have RAM in it, and another module might have ROM in it, and another one had logic circuits in it, and another one had I.O. circuits in it. So each one of these modules had a different purpose. And um, yeah, so that's good. Okay, so what did the Apollo guidance computer, what was it actually able to do? Well, there was, it had to be able to get data from a device on the spacecraft called the IMU. That stands for Inertial Measuring Unit. And the Inertial Measuring Unit was a series of gyroscopes and other instruments that could determine the spacecraft's location and which way it was pointing, its attitude. And so it sent data to the computer so that the computer would know where the spacecraft was and where it was pointing. The computer could communicate with the ground. It could transmit information to the controllers back in Houston, and it could receive updates from the controllers in Houston. It was connected to an optical system. This is kind of interesting, and I could talk for 20 minutes on just this right here, but 
in order to refine the spacecraft's idea of where it was and which direction it was pointing, they actually had a sextant on board, an optical sextant, and they would sight on stars exactly the way mariners have been doing for thousands and thousands of years and use that to refine their idea of where the spacecraft was. The computer could get information from the two radar systems that were on board. The, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. The rendezvous radar enabled the two spacecraft to find each other and get back together after the moon landing. And the landing radar was actually used during the landing. And I'll talk to you more about that in just a second. It had to be able to send and receive information from the from the display and keyboard. So there was a, a unit we're gonna see in just a second that allowed the astronauts to enter data and to get data from the computer. It had to be able to drive the flight instruments. So there were all kinds of instruments on the control panel that were very similar to what the astronauts were used to from their piloting activities from flying aircraft. And so the computer actually had to uh, drive those instruments so that they would be able to fly the spacecraft. The astronauts had controls that they could use to steer the spacecraft, and those had to be able to send information to the computer. But most importantly, the point of all of this was so that the computer could fire engines. So the, the lunar module that actually landed on the moon had two different engines. It also had thrusters that it used to control what direction it was heading in. And the computer actually drove all of those and fired those engines. We'll talk more about that in just a second as well. So the software. So as we said, the hardware was the same in both spacecraft, but different software in each spacecraft. The software in the command module was known as Colossus and the software that was running on the computer in the lunar module was called Luminary. And there was a total of about 1400 person years in developing that software. And at the peak of the project, uh, there were 350 software developers working on this project. Here's what the code looks like. And a modern day assembly language programmer would be able to look at this and would not feel at all out of place. So the programming was very much like what a modern day assembly language programmer would, would see. And the source code is actually available. And I'll tell you where to get that if there's any programmers watching this. And I love the, the, the people that put this together really had a sense of humor. And I love reading some of the comments that they wrote about the code and some of the notes they had about the code. And as an example, this is the beginning of the code to fire the engines. And the name they gave to the code, which fires the engines is burn baby. So I love that. So what was it like to use this computer? Well, the astronauts had a unit that enabled them to interface with the computer. There was no flat screen LED monitors back then. Um, keyboards were large and clunky. There was no such thing as a mouse back then. So how did they interact with the computer? They did it through a device called the Disky. And Disky is spelled D-S-K-Y and it's short for display keyboard. And that's what it looks like right there. There was one in the lunar module, and here's a photo of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin in the uh, lunar module simulator, and that's the control panel for the lunar module. And right there, you can see the disky that they would use to enter uh, data and read out data from the computer in the lunar module. This is the control panel for the command module, and right front and center, you can see the disky that they used to interface with the computer in the command module. Here's a close up of what a real disky looked like. And this photo was actually taken during the beginning of the Apollo program. So what is all that stuff? Well, let's talk about it because it's really interesting, the scheme that they came up with for the astronauts to be able to use this computer. So here's a diagram of the disky and what it would have looked like in operation. And you can see it's sort of divided up into three sections. So in the upper left, we have a bunch of indicator lights. And we're not gonna talk about these a lot. Mostly what they did was just indicate status of different equipment. And I'll just explain what a couple of the lights were. So in the first column, third from the bottom, you can see 
uh, a light that says O-P-R-E-R-R, -R, and that stands for operator error. And if the astronauts were keying something into the keyboard and they got something wrong, that light would come on to tell them they had made a mistake. Um, there's a light at the top of the second column that says temp, and that tells them that uh, the uh, temperature in one of the pieces of navigation equipment is too high or too low. And you can see third down in that column, there's a light that says prog, P-R-O-G, and that tells them that a program error has a, had occurred. In other words, that uh, some sort of error in the software had occurred. And we'll talk about a couple other lights here shortly. Over on the right-hand side, we have the displays. There are six displays. Three of them are two-digit displays. Three of them are five-digit displays. We're gonna talk about them in detail in just a second. And then at the bottom is the keyboard. And there are 19 keys there. And most of them will look pretty familiar to you. You have plus and minus, you have all the numbers. There's clear, there's enter, there's reset. And, and so most of those are fairly familiar, but there's a couple on here that are kind of unusual. We're gonna talk about them in a little bit. So let's talk about the displays. So the top display is a two digit number called the program. And there were about 40 different programs in the Apollo guidance computer and they each had a number identified with them. And that's how the astronauts knew them. They didn't refer to the name. There was no alpha, alphabetic characters here. So they would refer to a program as P20 or P11 or P63. So every program had a number and the astronauts knew all the numbers because they had to. On the next line, we've got two numbers, which are the verb and noun. Wow, that doesn't sound like a computer term. We're gonna talk about that more in detail in just a second. And then below that are three lines which make up the registers. And that's just data that the computer is displaying. And what that data is depends on what the computer's doing at a particular time. And we'll look at some of that in just a second. So let's go back and talk about the verbs and nouns for just a second. What is that about? Well, it's a really ingenious method that they came up for being able to work with the computer. So the verb was just a command to do something, and the noun was the piece of data that they were going to do it with. So if you wanted the computer to do something, you'd key in a two-digit verb that would tell it what you wanted to do, and you might key in a two-digit noun that would say, what do I want you to do that with? And I'm gonna give you a little demonstration here and show you how it actually works. I've got a little simulator for the Apollo guidance computer here, and let me show you what that looks like. So here we go. Um, so let's, uh, let's see a couple of things I can do. Now, unfortunately, the really cool stuff that the computer would do would take me hours to explain. And frankly, I don't understand a lot of it. But remember the purpose of the computer is to guide you through space and work through all these complicated equations. Well, if if I said to you, watch this, I'm gonna solve a, a three axis equations of motion, you know, we'd all say, huh? So I'm just gonna show you some real simple things that the computer could do. So one of the things you would want to do before you trust your life to the computer is make sure that none of the lights are burnt out. Uh, because what if something, uh, there was some error condition, but the light that would tell you that there was an error had been burnt out. So they had a function that would enable them to light up all the lights in the display and in the set of lights on the left-hand side, just to make sure there were no burnt out uh, lights. So the way you did that was, you push the verb button, and then the command, the verb we wanna use is 35. And then I would press enter, and boom, it lights up all the lights and flashes a few of them. And that's just a way to make sure that all the lights were, uh, were, were working. Okay, let's say I wanna display a piece of data. Well, a real simple piece of data that everybody can understand is the current time. So what if I want to display the time? I would key in verb and then 06. 06, that verb means I want you to display a piece of data. 
Well, what piece of data do I want you to display? Noun 36, which is the current time. And then I would hit enter and it shows me the current time. So what this tells me is I am 19 hours, 36 minutes and 25 seconds into the flight. Well, sometimes I might not want uh, to know just what time it is at a particular instant, I might want a clock that's constantly displaying the time to me. Well, the way I could do that was verb 16, and again, noun 36, and verb 16 is monitor. And what it says is, every second, I want you to show me this value. And noun 36 is the current time. So now if I hit enter, I get a changing display. So it's 19 hours, 37 minutes, and 14 seconds, 15, 16, and so on into the mission. All right, let me clear that display. Easier said than done. Yeah. Here we go. OK, uh, and one more. Um, the computer had a sleep mode. How do I do that? Uh, so if I if I want to run if I want to put the computer in sleep mode, what I want to do is run program six. And the way I do that is verb and three seven. Three seven means I want to run a program. And then which program do I want to run? I want to run program six. Program six is the program that puts the computer to sleep. I hit enter and I get this display. It's flashing a verb 50 at me. And what 50 means is it's a signal to the astronaut. I want you to do something. Well, what do you want me to do? The flashing 25 here means I want you to go to the checklist and go to item number 62 and do that. And that involves flipping a couple switches on the control panel. And then I click the proceed button to say, okay, I'm ready to power down. And this is what happens. The computer goes into what they called standby, but it's just sleep mode. And when I wanna wake the computer up, I just push the pro button again and it starts up. So there's some real simple operations, but it gives you some idea of what it was like to use this computer. Oh, where's my mouse? Okay, there we go. Oh, so I wanna show you, so you remember when I did that demo just now, the first thing I did was a lamp test. I wanted to show you a video of the real thing. So this is a, a TV transmission from Apollo 11. That's Mike Collins. And you can see on the right-hand side, you can see the disky there, and you can see the keyboard and the displays and the lights that we've seen. And he's going to do a demonstration of just exactly what we just did. Now, it's really hard to understand the audio. Don't worry about it. But I just want you to see he's going to do exactly what I just did. He's going to do verb 35 hit enter, and all the lights are going to light up. There's a spirit that uh, speaks quite tell what sort of animal looks like wearing foo. Uh, we see you punching in uh, a verb uh, 35, I think it is. Uh, tell me, you can't, or tell me, you can't see everybody hold on their hands, I'll push the enter button. Right. And we see a real display now. And he was able to clear to the display much more elegantly than I could. He's far more used to using it than I am. So 
that's what the real thing looked like. And you can see it, it behaved exactly the way as, as mine did. So how did they remember all of these numbers? So there were 40 different programs and each one of them had a two digit number. And there were about almost a hundred verbs and each one of them had a two digit number and a hundred nouns and each one of them had a two digit number. Well, they remembered all the common ones just because they had been training for six months on how to fly the spacecraft. And so a lot of this was just second nature to them. But they also had cheat sheets everywhere. So here's a, a diagram that shows a section of the control panel in the command module. And you can see right there printed on the control panel is a list of some of the more common verbs and nouns. Here's a photo that was taken in the lunar module, and you can see they have this little utility tray that folds out from the computer that they could put stuff on, and printed on the tray is the complete list of all the nouns and verbs and programs. So it was right there for them to refer to as well. And the guide that they used to flying the mission was called the flight plan, and anytime they were going to use the computer, the flight plan would have in it the programs and verbs that they were likely to need while they were doing this part of the, of the mission. So they had lots and lots of cheat sheets that they could use along the way. So what did the astronauts think of this? So this guy is David Scott, one of the astronauts. He flew on Gemini 8, Apollo 9, and he landed on the moon on Apollo 15. And what makes him particularly interesting is there was an astronaut assigned to each facet of the spacecraft and the mission. So they would have, one of the astronauts would go work with the people that manufactured the first stage of the rocket. And somebody else would go work with the manufacturer that manufactured the lunar module and so on. Dave Scott was the guy that was assigned to work with MIT on the development of the computer. So he was actually involved in the development of the computer. And here's what he had to say about the this verb noun system that I just showed you. But how do you take a pilot and put him in a spaceship and have him talk to a computer? That was That's not easy in real time. And I think somebody, and I don't even remember who came up with a verb noun concept because it was very simple for us to operate with a series of uh, two-digit numbers uh, representing verbs and another series of two-digit numbers representing nouns. And it's it's so straightforward and simple that even pilots could learn how to use it. <laughs> so the astronauts actually thought this was a great system compared to other systems that they might have used to talk to a spacecraft computer. They really liked this one. So need to move along. I'm going to run out of time here, but um, I want to talk to, I want to look at one particular facet of the mission and show you how the computer played a part in it. We're going to talk about actually landing on the moon. So the spacecraft that landed on the moon was the lunar module, and it had one of the computers in it, of course. And so we're going to talk from this point forward strictly about the lunar module and its computer. So each mission had just one attempt to land on the moon. There was no such thing as a second chance. It had to go right every time. And here's what most people don't realize. Almost all of the flying was done by the computer itself. The astronauts actually did very little of the control of the lunar module during a landing. The landing process was about 12 minutes long and it was broken up into three phases and each one of them was handled by a separate program in the computer. So the computer would run the first program, then would run the second program, then would run the third program. And at the end of the third program, if everything had worked right, they were going to be on the moon. So the first phase was called the braking phase and the program that ran it that, that managed this was known as P63, Program 63. So Program 63 started a few minutes before they needed to start the process of descending to the moon. So seven or eight minutes before they expected to actually start the descent, they would start Program 63. And Program 63 would look at where it was and it knew where it was supposed to land and it would do all the calculations and figure out when it need to fire the engine. 
at this point, the crew is about 50,000 feet off the surface of the moon. Then at exactly the right point, the computer would fire the engine. And at this point, it's again at about 50,000 feet. It's about 240 miles from the landing site at this point, traveling at 3,777 miles per hour. And we're about 12 minutes from landing at this point. So the idea is, 240 miles from here, we have to get the speed down to zero and we have to get the altitude down to zero. And we have to do those at exactly the same time at exactly the right place to be to have a successful landing. Now, throughout the braking phase, while P-63 is running, the computer is doing all the flying. The astronauts are just passive passengers at this point. Their really only job is to just look at the data in the computer and make sure the computer is doing everything correctly. Well, how did they do that? Well, they had what they called cue cards and they, they looked like this and it showed the crew, they, they pre-calculated these values on earth and they'd figured out at 30 seconds after ignition and a minute after we fire the engines and a minute and 30 and so on, what angle should we be flying at? What should the velocity be? What should our altitude be? What should the throttle settings be? And so if what they saw the computer doing matched up what they knew that it was supposed to be doing from these pre-calculated numbers, then they knew the computer was doing what it was supposed to do. So P-63 lasted for about eight minutes. And by the time it's done, they're down to about 7,000 feet. They're slowed down to about 477 miles per hour. And they've got about two miles to go to the landing site. Now, the interesting thing to note, if you look at the lunar module, it's flying on its side at this point. And the astronauts are really trusting the computer because they cannot see where they're going. When their view out the window is pretty much just straight up. They can see a little bit of the moon's surface way off in the distance, but they really cannot see where they're going. When the lunar module gets down to about 7,000 feet, program 63 ends, program 64 starts, and the first thing it does is tip the lunar module over so that it's almost vertical. And now for the first time, the crew can actually see where they're going. The computer is still doing all the flying, but now the crew can see where they're going. And one of the interesting things, so one of the questions that they had to solve was, how can we get the computer to show the crew where it's headed? and where it's actually expecting to land. And they came up with this really interesting idea called a landing point designator. So the window on the commander's side of the spacecraft had these little uh, degree markings on them. And the computer would display a number called the landing point designator. And what that meant is if the commander looked out his window at that angle, the spot of the moon that he saw at that angle was where the computer was trying to take them. So he could look to see if the computer was taking them to a boulder patch or whether it was taking them to some place where they could have a successful landing. The computer is still doing all the flying, but at this point they could enter data into the computer to tell it to go a little bit left, a little bit right, a little bit further, a little bit shorter. They could alter where the computer was headed, but it's still doing all the flying. Finally, they get down to about 500 feet and the commander flips a switch by his thumb. They're about 90 seconds from landing and that puts them in what's called the landing phase and the computer switches over to program 66. The computer is still flying the spacecraft, but the commander has got his hand on the joystick and can signal in real time to the computer where he wants to go. So he can push his joystick forward, back, left, right, and the computer will take the spacecraft where he indicates. So this is sometimes called manually flying the spacecraft, but it's really not. It's still the computer that's doing everything. It's just the commander is telling the computer where to go. And that ends when the spacecraft actually lands on the surface.
So I'd like to do a, a demo for you, and I'll try to get through this as quickly as we can. We're going to ride along with Apollo 12. This was the second lunar landing mission. It was uh, on November 19th, 1969. It landed in what was known as the Ocean of Storms. It's not really an ocean. It's just a flat area on the moon. And it was the very first precision landing. The United States had landed an unmanned spacecraft about two and a half years earlier called Surveyor 3 on the moon. And they were going to try to land right next to it and bring back some of the parts. So Apollo 11 had not worried about exactly where it landed. They just wanted to get down safely. These guys needed to land within walking distance of Surveyor 3. So here are the people we're interested in. The commander of the flight is Pete Gordon. The guy who, is, who was known as the lunar module pilot, he wasn't really though, and I'll explain that in just a second, was Al Bean. And of course, the third important person along is the Apollo guidance computer right there. So I'm going to get, and the reason I say Al Bean wasn't really the lunar module pilot. From that, you'd expect that he was the one flying the, the uh, spacecraft. He wasn't. The commander always did that. Al Bean's job was to call numbers out to Pete Conrad right before landing. So he would call out altitude and speed and, and fuel and that sort of thing to help uh, guide Pete Conrad so that he could just concentrate on looking outside the spacecraft, using his joystick to tell the computer where to go as Al Bean called out numbers. So here's something I've never seen done before. I want to show you what it actually looked like to do a landing on the moon using this computer. So we're going to go back to our mock-up of the computer here. And I'm going to click verb 37, which says I want to run a program. And the program I want to run was 63. Remember, that was the first one of the programs to land on the moon. And I hit enter. And this is what happens. So the computer is displaying data for me here. And it's done all the calculations to figure out when it needs to burn the engine. This is the speed of the spacecraft right there, that first number. This is when the computer has calculated it needs to burn the engine to start the descent. So in six minutes and 41 seconds, it needs to light the engine and begin to the descent to get to the landing spot. And this number down here is called the Delta V. Don't worry about it. It's not going to be important. Now, I'm not going to make you wait for six minutes and 26 seconds. So we're gonna jump ahead a little bit here. So we're now 44 seconds, 42 seconds before the computer is gonna light the engines. At 35 seconds, the computer is gonna completely blank the display just to get the astronauts attention because something important is about to happen here. Five seconds later, the display comes back. When it gets down to five seconds and it's getting ready to light the engine, it's going to display a 99 flashing in the verb spot. And that's what the computer always did to ask the astronauts, I'm ready to light the engines. Is it OK? And the crew had to press the proceed button to tell the computer that it was OK to light the engine. So there's the flashing 99. And one of the crews would have hit the proceed button and the computer lights the engine. And now we're going to start heading towards the lunar surface. We've got some different data displayed here. This is the number of miles to the landing spot now. And this is how long it's going to stay in program 63. So it's going to spend the next eight minutes just firing the engine to slow the spacecraft down and um, uh, get towards the surface. Now you notice over here we've got two lights lit and I want to explain that real quick. It, those stand for altitude and velocity. The spacecraft has a radar unit on it, but at this altitude the radar can't see the surface and it can't determine accurately the altitude and velocity of the spacecraft, the speed of the spacecraft, the altitude and speed of the spacecraft. Those are important things to know and so 
what the hope is that as we get closer to the surface, the radar will be able to lock onto the surface and be able to get an accurate reading of the altitude and velocity. Those lights have to go out when, when the radar unit gets a lock on the surface, when it has an accurate altitude and velocity from the surface of the moon, those lights will go out. And if they don't go out, we can't land on the moon. So let's see what that looked like. So we jumped ahead a little bit, about two and a half minutes, and what the crew would have seen, they would have been watching this like a hawk, and they would have seen, in a second, the altitude light goes off, and then the velocity light goes off, and now we've got a third number being displayed. That's our altitude above the moon. So we're at 38,040 feet off the surface of the moon. So now we've got the accurate data that we need to actually land on the moon. So again, for in this case, almost another five minutes, it's gonna continue burning the engine, slowing the spacecraft down, dropping in altitude. This is all part of program 63. We're gonna jump ahead a little bit about three minutes. And we're down to about 19,000 feet. And this is a camera that's aimed out of one of the windows. This is a camera that's aimed out of one of the uh, windows and they really cannot see where they're going. They can see some of the lunar surface off in the distance. When they get down to 7,000 feet, remember one of the things that happens is the limb pitches over and now they can see where they're going. Let's see what that looks like. This is the altitude right here. Okay, so you could hear the excitement when he finally got his first view of where they, uh, where they were headed, and he recognized things. So you notice right here we've got it. Uh, we've got forty-two, and they keep talking about the LPD. So if the commander looks out his window at forty-one degrees, he'll see exactly where they're headed, where the computer is taking them. So this continues for another couple of minutes. And at some point, they'll be down close to about 500 feet. And that's when they're going to switch to program 66. And the commander is going to start using his joystick to actually guide it down to the surface. And you're going to hear him say, I got it. And when he says, I got it, he's flipped the switch that's going to switch the computer to program 66 and put him in control. Let's hear what that looked like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're at 350 feet. These two numbers tell them how fast they're dropping vertically and how fast they're traveling horizontally. P Al Bean is going to be calling out numbers and you're going to hear him say like 300 feet. That's the altitude. You'll hear him talking. Uh, he'll say something like five down and that means they're dropping at five feet per second. And you'll hear him call out a percentage and that's how much fuel they have left. And you'll hear that number get very low. So let's take a look at what the last couple of seconds of the landing looked like. And, and again, Al Bean is looking at the computer, getting these numbers off the computer. Nine percent fuel. Nine percent. Nine percent. Nine percent. 
And I love how excited he gets there. And so quite a, quite an e-ticket ride. And you can see the computer has switched to program 68. And program 68 is what it does when they're on the moon. So they've had a successful landing. And the result of the landing was this. They actually did land within walking distance of the Surveyor 3 spacecraft, and they took some parts off of it, brought them back to the to Earth, and some of them are in the Smithsonian now. Okay, I know I'm running a little bit late. Let me just talk about a couple of things that came out of the program, and then we'll see if we got any questions. So many pioneering things came out of this project. The logic was built entirely with integrated circuits. I don't know that any computer had ever done that before. It did real-time processing. You couldn't, uh, back then, you know, you fed a deck of cards into a computer and you came back a few hours later and the computer had your results. That wouldn't do when you're landing on the moon. The computer had to be able to do the calculations as things were happening. The Apollo computer was the first one to use something called priority multitasking. It used to be that if the computer was working on 10 different things, it gave them all the same amount of computing time and it treated them all equally. Well, the people that designed this computer knew that when you're landing on the moon, some things are more important than others. And there are certain things that you had to be absolutely sure you got done, whereas other things could be allowed to slide. So they had this idea that some things were more important to others and that's where the computer had to give its attention first. It was the first fly or one of the it was the first flyby wire system in a spacecraft and one of the first digital flyby wire systems in an air in in any craft. And what this means is that the astronauts didn't directly control any of the engines. They told the computer what they wanted to do with their flight controls, and then the computer did it. And by the way, every airliner today does that. And they developed the discipline of software engineering. They developed the science that we use today uh, to design software. And they had this concept called crash and restart. If the computer had an error, it would reboot itself, just like computers today do. But you couldn't take 60 seconds to reboot. The computer had to be able to completely if, if it encountered an error, it had to be back up and running within two seconds. And that actually happened a couple of times and it successfully did it every time. I'd like to talk real quickly about a couple of people. The first one is Margaret Hamilton. No, not that Margaret Hamilton, that Margaret Hamilton. She was the director of software engineering at MIT at, at uh, MIT's instrumentation lab, which is where the computer was designed. And she was an amazing figure, one of the first computer scientists. Um, she published over 130 papers in her career, and she and her team invented the discipline of software engineering. Here she is with some of the printouts from the Apollo guidance computer. And 47 years after the first moon landing, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom 
um, because of her work on the Apollo program. We talked earlier about this guy who had the vision for the Apollo guidance computer, Dr. Charles Draper. And today, the uh, computer, uh, the, the what used to be the instrumentation lab, is now called the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory at MIT. Some references to the Apollo guidance computer. There was a great movie in 1995 called Apollo 13. And of course there was an Apollo guidance computer on the spacecraft. And the thing I loved about that movie is one of my favorite movies of all time. They got everything about the computer exactly right. Every time it showed a number, it was the correct number. There was another movie in 2017 called Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. It was a campy piece of sci-fi that didn't do very well in the reviews. I thought it was really great, but uh, opinions vary. There's a scene at the end of the movie where our heroes are in a derelict spacecraft floating out in space. And here's a screenshot from that movie. And the thing I love so much about it is on the control panel, there is an Apollo guidance computer right there. I don't know why they did that, but there we go. You can buy reproductions of the Disky, the display and keyboard for the Apollo guidance computer. There are a lot of people just like me that are just fascinated by this computer and several people have built reproductions of it. And I've even tried to do reproductions by 3D printing some of the parts. And here's a couple of the parts I've 3D printed and I still got a ways to go. There's exactly one working Apollo guidance computer today. It was restored by uh, a YouTuber named Curious Mark. He and his engineering team got this computer working again. And there's a link down there where you can go uh, find out how they did it and all the things they had to do to get this computer working again. And I'll make these slides available so you don't have to write this down. If you're interested in reading more, there's a book called The Apollo Guidance Computer by Frank O'Brien. Great book. I've read it. There's another book called Digital Apollo by David Mendel, also about the Apollo Guidance Computer. Um, at this address here, uh, the site is called Virtual AGC, and they actually have a simulator of the Apollo Guidance Computer. They have all the source code for it available, and they have every NASA document they could get their hands on about the Apollo Guidance Computer. And if you want to take a look at the actual program, you can get it at that link right there. So sorry we ran a little bit over, but that's what I've got. And I hope you found that at least uh, maybe not quite as interesting as I do, but um, I hope that was interesting. And thanks. Mark, that was fascinating. I tell you what, I was with you all the way. I remember <laughs> when that first computer or that first a um, spaceship went on, went to the moon, and it was so exciting. Yeah, I'm sure we have questions, so let's open it up for Mark. Anybody have a question? Please raise your hand. Margaret, would you do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Thank you. I'm just trying to raise my hand. Um, you know, I find it amazing. I started in computers back in really '63, punching cards, and then actually doing code 1401. You know, with the 4K overlay. And assembler was also my language. So I was really pleased to see the assembler uh, language uh, again. That was really lovely. But I, I'm amazed that we were limited by the amount of, um, you know, we can only, and were you up, were you, did you have a limit too? Like we had 8K, 4K, and then 8K. Did you get up to 8K when you did your, was the programming in 8K of, of space and overlays? So, so they had uh, they had 4K of RAM and yeah. they had 36, uh, uh, approximately 72K of ROM. And that was it. There was no disk drive. There was no tape drive. Everything had to fit into that amount of memory. Okay. It's just really interesting because we would have to do a pass at the data for the first round and then come back and rerun the, this data for the second round because we couldn't hold all the instructions at the same time. So just interesting, yep. that's amazing, uh, the, the complexity. So I really appreciated it. Oh, thank you very much. Mark, there are a couple other questions. How about Dave Somolinsky? Yeah, um, probably when they had their radar overflow or overflow computer messages. Can you talk about that? 
Yeah, the program alarms on Apollo 11, that's what you're asking about? Yes. Yeah, okay. So what happened there? That wasn't actually the computer's fault. I get very defensive about my, my pet computer here. What happened was there was a piece of equipment that was supposed to take information from the landing radar and feed it to the computer. And it was just supposed to tell the computer when something had changed. So it would say, okay, the value went up by one. Now it went up by another one. And, and it was supposed to send occasional messages to the computer to tell the computer that the value had changed. Well, what it wound up doing was sending messages essentially saying, okay, it went up by one. No, now it went back to zero. Up, it went up by one. Nope, take that away. It went back to zero. And it was sending, it was barraging the computer with these messages telling it that the landing radar was going up and down when it, it really wasn't. So, uh, and the computer had to take some time uh, every time one of those messages came in to process it. And the computer could not keep up with this other work. And it got the, the error messages were 1201 and 1202. And they got five of those during the mission. Um, and uh, it, it just the computer had gotten overloaded because it couldn't handle all these messages that this piece of equipment was sending it. So every time one of those messages came in, the computer rebooted itself. Two seconds later, it was back on the job. And obviously the landing happened successfully. And Armstrong said after the mission that he, you know, he could see that the program was getting these errors and he was worried about them, but he could never actually tell that the spacecraft went off course at all. The computer just handled it and got back on the job. So it was really a triumph for the computer, um, despite the fact that this piece of equipment next to it that it was connected to had malfunctioned. Andrew. Does that help? Yes. That's a great explanation. How about Huey? You had a question for Mark? Huey? You're muted, Huey. Yeah. I, I said the same thing to myself. You just didn't hear me. Uh, <laughs> Mark, that was that was just marvelous. Uh, I, I just, I was riveted, hoping they were going to make it, knowing that they did, but still, uh, uh just the, the way you put this together was fascinating. And I and I was watching the, the participants as far as the numbers go. You didn't lose anybody at all until you landed. And uh, so uh, excellent uh, presentation and uh, a, a different approach to learning about the history of our computers. Thank you. Thank you, Huey. I appreciate that. What a, what a great, what a great, hour and a half we spent with you. Is there anybody else that has a question before we have to leave? For Mark, anybody else going once, twice? Oh, okay, there it goes. Steve. It looks like Hi, Steve, Steve, maybe. Yeah, Steve. Uh -huh. Do you remember a video game called Lunar Lander? I do. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very realistic, obviously, but I remember playing <laughs> <laughs> I do. That's funny. Steve Parker, did you have a question or was that you? That was it. Oh, that was it. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Mark, we want to thank you again. What a fantastic presentation and come back often. Will you? I, I will be happy to. If anybody has any questions later, I'll send out the, uh, the, the slides. I'll give them to Huey and, and, uh, yeah. Bill. And uh, if you have questions later, my email address is in it. Feel free to email me. That's that would be great. Well, if you if you could, you would hear roaring applause. <laughs> OK, well, thank you. Well, all right. You're all muted, so you can't. At any rate, you are well applauded. All right. Well, and thank so you, everybody. Good night. And uh, I'll see you all soon. Great, Mark. And then for the rest of us and to finish up the evening, you all have a very safe week, my board. I will see you Monday night and have a blessed night. Good night, Good night everybody. everybody.